Well, let's go into this strange but most interesting field called mythology. <clears throat> mythology in Plato takes an analogical form. All right, that's very strict. And so let me introduce it for you. First, <clears throat> a myth expresses in symbolic form the journey of the soul, while the hero represents its ideal. Now, of course, a myth to be a myth needs several interesting ingredients, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but primarily needs a figure that is divine or divine descent. The myth needs a setting, and it needs a drama. And it serves a great purpose because it's going to express in symbolic form the journey of the soul. Now, Let's see what we can do with that. <clears throat> In the opening of Plato's Phaedo, there is a myth told, and the myth is of Theseus. Now, Theseus was the great hero who journeyed with 14 to the island of Crete, the Mononian Empire. And he went with the 14 because the 14 were to be sacrificed to the Minotaur, half man, half bull. And he went with them to break this ritual every four years they were doing this. And he decided, Theseus decided, therefore it was necessary to seek out the Minotaur, slay the Minotaur, return with the 14, return home. And of course, when he returned home, he became king. To get to the Minotaur, of course, he had to go through the labyrinth and seek out where it was, where the Minotaur was. To do that, of course, according to the myth, Adrienne gave him a thread, which he then tied to an object then and then descended down into the labyrinth so he could work his way back and a sword to slay the Minotaur. Now look here. Therefore, we have Theseus, the hero, who accompanies the 14 to slay the Minotaur and thus save the 14 and himself. Now, Plato mentions this in the beginning of the dialogue, the Phaedo, to account for why Socrates wasn't put to death immediately after the sentencing. Now, some very interesting people come by who are Pythagoreans. And they want to know from Phaedo, who was one of the 14, who was present at the death, the death scene of Socrates. And it turns out, therefore, that good heavens, you know what? They mention who was present at the death of Socrates, and it turns out to be 14 people. <clears throat> but it's 14 plus Socrates. Oh, is that a coincidence? Socrates, therefore, explores the very nature of death. And he comes up with a most interesting and most essential theory of Platonic thought. And that is true philosophy, true philosophy, is nothing other than the study of and the practice of death and dying. That's the goal of philosophy. The study of death <laughs> and the practice of dying. How do you practice dying? I guess if you fail in your practice, you may live. No. Now look here. So the first part of the dialogue, Socrates is going to explore what is meant by slaying death and practicing dying. Now, the people around 
Socrates, principally two people, two people, Cebes and Simeus. After they hear this discussion, which goes up to about 69 in the Stephanus numbers, they object and they say, look, Socrates, the soul may survive death, but how do you know when it survives death that it has any power and intelligence? And so now Socrates has to explore what particular objection leads them to this position that they have. What position is that? That the idea that the soul upon death may simply be like smoke and dissipate with the first wind. And so we have then an exploration of Cebes's position and Simeus's position. Now, that's just in general. Now I'd like to go into this one issue. You see, there's only one person in the myth who goes down into the labyrinth and slays the Minotaur. The 14 don't know that Theseus has slayed the Minotaur. Only Theseus knows he slayed the Minotaur. Upon slaying the Minotaur, he returns, convinces the 14 that he in fact has slayed the Minotaur, and they journey back home, and he becomes king. Now, we have the same thing here, because I think I'll show you that Socrates' goal is slaying death. Slaying death, that's the goal. They have the fear of death. And that fear, therefore, must be specific. It must be a particular kind of fear. It must have some content. But now, what does he mean by slaying death? Well, he's got a great line. And what he says is that the slaying of death is really a purification for the philosopher. And the purification is nothing other than the separation of the soul from the body. Now, the idea of the soul, you must understand, right, is thought of as something that encompasses the entire body. Because the idea of soul in Greek thought is primarily uh, vitality, the principle of life. Soul brings with it to the body a vitality and a life. And since the life extends throughout the entire body, Therefore, the task of the philosopher, if he can separate the soul from the body, means he has to be able to draw from all parts of the body, from all parts of the body, into a unity, the soul. That is a practice, that is a yoga, as we call it today. That is a spiritual discipline. And he describes it in one paragraph so beautifully that I thought I'd read it for you. And here it is. I'm now I'm reading at a section which, uh, if you have a reference to it, 67 CD, all right? All Platonic dialogues, when they're in print, have these numbers along the side. They're called the Stephanus numbers, so you can check it. In the Loeb edition, which I have, it's found on page 233. Hmm. Now. Remember, we're going to look for it. 
something described as a purification, that's a separation of the soul from the body, such in the way I just described it, that's going to be called death and that's going to be called a practice, something that you have to do, something you have to learn how to perform, it has to be developed as a custom or a habit. And does not the purification consist in this, which has been mentioned long ago in our discourse, something I've been talking about for a long time, in separating as far as possible the soul from the body and teaching the soul the habit, uh, custom it, habit, of collecting and bringing itself together from all parts of the body, okay, from all parts of the body, and then living alone. by itself, and what's most interesting now, so far as it can, both now, see, both now and hereafter. It's a practice of learning it both now and hereafter. Freed from the body as from fetters. That's the goal. Well then, this is what we call death, is it not? A release and separation from the body? Exactly so. But as we hold, true philosophers, and they alone, are always most eager to release the soul, and just this, the release and separation of the soul from the body. Is that their study or not? It's obviously. Then the true philosophers true philosophers, practice dying, and death is less terrible to them than to any other men. Now, what do they want to do it for? What do they get? What do they get for, by that separation? If he's really a philosopher, he will confidently believe that he will find pure wisdom nowhere else than here in the other world. The other world now is being described as, from that point of view, when the separation takes place, that experience is wisdom. Now, I have a couple more examples of what that means. But if this is what the philosopher alone does, then he's the only one who actually knows whether you can do this before you drop dead. Now, if you can pull this stunt off before you drop dead, then you know that there's the possibility then of releasing the soul from the body by this yogic, the spiritual discipline, and only the person who are willing to try it and do it can talk about whether or not it's possible to do. It's also only possible whether or not now you can uh, experience the state of wisdom by such a separation. Ah, therefore, Socrates alone as the philosopher is the one then who then engages in this separation and slays death. He then can slay death and therefore all the fears of death. Because if you know that there's a separation of the soul from the body, you can survive then there's no basis for a fear. Now, the 14 around him during this discussion, not one of them understands what we just read. None of them can deal with it because they have a dominant fear of death that blocks them from even understanding what we just went over. Therefore, Socrates takes now a second voyage where he now has to overcome their fear of death by discovering what ideas do they have that are so fearful that blocks them from understanding what we just went over. Ah, let's go back now. If Theseus is a hero, then he went with the 14, descended through that labyrinth, found the Minotaur, slayed the Minotaur, then returned and became king. Is it Socrates now the archetypal, the ideal? Is the philosopher the, is Socrates the philosophical hero? 
and as the philosophical hero's task to slay death now as well as hereafter so that therefore he can have personal experience of whether the separation of the soul from the body is possible or not if he is then he knows whether or not this is real or not no one else does and therefore Socrates then takes the 14 slays death but then what must he do he must now deal with their fears and all he can show <laughs> the only thing he does is to show that their fears are groundless by examining the arguments they have. If he can show them the arguments that they have are illogical and really don't follow what is said about death, then they are in an interesting situation of being able to discover that their arguments, which are so fearful about the nature of death, are not meaningful, but they may still fear it. They may, and Socrates says, yes, that's right. I can take you through this argument. You can see that the grounds for your fears are groundless. And there's only one thing I can do, he says, for you. He says, you have to go back over it again and again and again, because you have to see what premises your very arguments depend upon and examine those. So going back to the myth. So therefore, it looks like we have something curious going on here. We have a deliberate use of myth, the Theseus myth. But now you see, in Plato's use, he has the commemorating this event by going to the island of Delos. Delos is sacred to Apollo. Now, everything said about Apollo can be gathered together into a very coherent picture and if you're interested in checking this, you'll enjoy reading Marciad Iliad's Shamanism. Let me just cite it for you, all right? Shaman, shamanism, Marciad Iliad. He has a section on Apollo and he says the Greeks were really shamanists. They had this, this whole development of shamanism which is a kind of the, uh, a natural development of a spiritual system very akin to the yogic systems but it emerges spontaneously in all people and this particular development of shamanism he says in the Greek world is basically Apollo based and part of it is the separation of the soul from the body the very thing we're talking about now all through this dialogue of Plato's, we'll see that the ideas of Apollo brought together into a unity, every one of them can be found in the dialogue, the Phaedo. Everything that's said about Apollo, you can find someplace in the dialogue where that very issue is explored. Therefore, there are two myths going on. The, the, the hero, the hero represents the ideal, and the major figure in our story is Theseus, the hero. And now we're saying the philosophical hero is Socrates. And in the present world, any philosopher who does this is equally heroic. Therefore, this myth represents, in a very typical way, the journey of the soul separating from the body. Everything that entails can be expressed mythically and can be represented in this myth. Now, let's go to the next step. All right, let's go to the next step. <clears throat> what is this like? What is this like? This, uh, what, does the, what is encountered in this experience? What is experienced? What is encountered through the spiritual discipline of the separating the soul from the body? What does the person experience? What is it like? And what does it tell us and how do that how can we use that in terms of a myth? Well, two things now. Watch what we're going to say. What the soul experiences in its journey, what the soul experiences in its journey, let us say it is these things, A, B, C for a moment. For each of these, over here, parallel to it, is going to be a parallel to it about the nature of reality. 
as seen by Plato. The distinctions the soul discovers, the conditions of its journey, are going to have parallels over here in the nature of reality. Let's see if we can see that. At the end of the dialogue, the Phaedo, at the end of the dialogue, the Phaedo, Socrates is asked about this very separation, about this journey of the soul. And Socrates then gives an account of it. This is the next myth. This is the next myth. And this, therefore, is going to be a description of that experience. And on this side, now. On this side, hereafter. Or after physical death. Now, what are we saying? There's a parallel structure. There's a parallel structure. That's what, we'd, what we would like to see. What the soul encounters as a psychic event has its parable in the structure of reality. Okay. That's what we've been saying. Through the arguments that Socrates advances, what he comes out to say through these arguments, which if we had time we could go through, but essentially what he says about the soul is not only is it possible to separate it, but in separating you can then experience the nature of wisdom, but you also can discover that it is immortal and indestructible. Since it's immortal and indestructible, this particular life that you're leading is only one in a series of reincarnations. Therefore, he says, since the soul is immortal and is reincarnated again and again, we must take great care of the soul, especially since we must regard it in respect to all time. First thing, what must we say about it? Upon the separation, upon the separation, the soul takes two things along with it. Its education and its nurture. Now, uh, we use the word education, but their use of the word education is far more interesting. <clears throat> it's what they call a paideia. Now, the whole education of the philosopher king in Plato's Republic is described as a paideia. And that's the whole training of the philosopher king. That's the whole training of the philosopher for this kind of vision. That's what he calls education. That's paideia. All right? And this is nurture. So you have to, you take with you, you take with you in such a journey all that you then have developed kind of like your psychic inheritance, everything you've developed, you take with it, as well as what you have nurtured as a result of it. Therefore, it brings with it, it brings with it benefits and injuries. That is, it could injure one, it could benefit one. Now we're over here in the hereafter. Whatever then you take into the next world, Right. That may help you, that may hinder you. What you take with you when you separate the soul from the body, right. you're going to drop everything so that you can see it as purely as you can. Now let's go back here. Therefore, we're now taking the point of departure, now we're talking about the hereafter. At the moment of death, now this, by the way, is very similar in many respects to the Tibetan Book of the Dead. <clears throat> the departed from the very beginning of his journey takes all of that positive, what he's developed, right? and also the views which may harm him. It goes along with it. At the moment of death, according to the Platonic vision, you have been allotted, each of us has been allotted a guide. 
goes along, that's allotted to us, what sometimes Christians call the guardian angel, as it were. A guide accompanies us on our earthly journey, and upon death, it then becomes our guide into the next world. <clears throat> Why? Because you have to be brought to a place where you're going to be judged. Now, there are two things that may happen. For the orderly and the wise soul, it follows and understands the circumstances that are going on, and therefore it follows its guide to the place of judgment. Second, ah, there are those that still cling to the body and desire the body, and therefore it flits around and resists and must be led finally with violence and with difficulty. So there are two possibilities for this journey with the guide. All right, one is positive, one is negative. Now, Socrates now wants to describe what it's like. What is it like for the person who has trained in their life for the separation of the soul from the, from the body, the philosopher, those people of that nature, and all the other people. That's his next goal. He wants to describe what it's like to experience here if one has in fact been the philosopher and those who have not. Those who have not therefore had the experience of the separation of the soul from the body. Now, to do that, he then describes what, it, what, what is encountered. And what he describes first, he says, really, you get a different vision of the earth, the true earth. He calls it the true earth. You now can see the true, birth, the true earth upon departure, once you're now soul is separated from the body. Now, those who can see it and participate in it, discover three things. It's not just the true earth you encounter. It's in fact the true heaven. And in fact, it is in fact the true and real light. Now in the Platonic world, the separation of the soul from the body in an experience of wisdom takes on a very interesting title. What is it that you encounter? You encounter what is called the most brilliant light of being. To experience that and to know that that's the nature of reality, including yourself, that is wisdom. Therefore, all right, he now is going to try to describe for you how this real earth is experienced by two types of people. Those that have been properly trained and those that have not. In order to do that, he says, look here, for the person who separated the soul from the body upon the death, all right, now they can see the true earth, the true heaven, the true light, and then he can contrasts it with what our present perception of our earth is like as viewed through the body. That's the contrast. What's he going to do? He's going to say, hey, I'm going to show you something. Upon the separation of the soul from the body, upon death, or equally this death, now, you're going to then discover something. And it's in marked contrast between the way in which you view things as viewed through the body and the senses. What do you encounter? Why, this is what you encounter. And now he has to give 
more substance, obviously, to it than just these titles, and therefore I can read a couple of sections so you can see exactly how he contrasts the two. Now, <clears throat> he said, our view, as viewed from the body, he said, you know what, he says, we don't really realize that while we live in the earth, we really live, as it were, in a marsh, in a, uh, we're in a mist, in a corroded environment, smog, <laughs> kind of a psychic smog. And we take that to be real. He says, oh, it's much like fish, you know. Fish think that what they're living in is the reality. He said, but once in a while, he said, you get a fish that, that uh, sticks its head above the water and takes a look out. He said, for these, that's like separating the soul from the body. Because so long as you're viewing things from the body's viewpoint, you don't recognize that you're living in this psychic smog. Well, now we need to read what he considers that. Right? He says, but to be able to see this nature of reality in this way, he says, you know, oh, he said, it's not easy. You have to develop strength. You have to become strong enough to bear and endure the sight of that light. It is so brilliant, so magnificent. But if you do, then you recognize that that's the real heaven the real light, and the real earth. All right, let me give you a couple of sections so I can share that with you. And it's a very lovely kind of thing, which I enjoy reading. Um, I believe that the earth is very large and that we who dwell between the pillars of Hercules and the river Thasus live in a small part of it about the sea like ants or frogs about a, about a pond and that many other people live in many other such regions. For I believe that there are in all directions on the earth many hollows of various forms and sizes into which water, mist, air have run together. But the earth itself is pure and situated in a pure heaven in which the stars are, are and, and the heaven which those who discourse about such matters call the ether. Now we do not perceive that we live in the hollows, but we think we live in the upper surface. Now, I believe this, this is the case with us. For we, we, we live in a, and dwell on a hollow of the earth and think we live on its upper surface. So he, would, he who would see things in the upper world, if his nature was strong enough to bear the sight, he'd recognize that that's the real heaven and the real light and the real earth. But in our world, there's nothing perfect here. We're mired, right? nothing beautiful here. But things in that world are even much more superior to those in this world. I'll tell you what it's like. When it's seen from above, the colors are brighter, purer than ours more wonderful beauty, golden, white, whiter than chalk and snow. It 
And the earth is made up of the uh, other colors likewise. More in number, more beautiful than those we see here. And in this fair earth, things that grow, trees, flowers, fruits, are correspondingly beautiful. So too the mountains, stones, more transparent, more lovely in color than ours. In fact, highly prized stones, and he goes on to mention jaspers, emeralds, and other gems, are fragments of what they are there. There, everything is like these, still more beautiful. The earth there is adorned with all of these jewels, gold, silver, everything. Plain sight, abundant, large, so that the earth, here's his conclusion, so the earth is a sight to make those blessed who look upon it. So if you can look upon it, if you can look upon it from this view, that's the basis of blessedness. And what's it like? I'm skipping a bit here and there. The seasons there are tempered so that people there have no diseases, live much longer, and in sight, hearing, and wisdom, and all such things, they're much superior to us. And they have sacred groves and temples of the gods in which the gods really dwell. And they have intercourse with the gods by speech, prophecies, visions, and they see the sun, the moon, and the stars as they really are. And in all other ways, their blessedness is in accord with us. So in this region, what do the souls then expect? They can then, right, on the side, they then have uh, conversations, dialogues with the gods, right? then through prophecies, through visions. They are real temples there. He's talking about what it's like in the afterworld for those people then who've gone through this training, through this experience. And then on this side, of course, he talks about the dirt and the impossibility of understanding and the difficulties and the ugliness of the world as seen through the body. Now, I wondered whether I can do two things. I'm going to introduce you to two things now. Now he's going to talk about more about the geography of the afterworld. Now, he calls this picture of the real condition of the earth <clears throat> serpent-like. Through the middle of it is a hollow, and there are four rivers that run through there and lakes. Now, those souls that have been judged now are sent someplace. We have already heard where the philosophers are sent and what they experience, and now he wants to give an overview of what happens to everyone else. Now, I can go over this quickly. It's quite interesting because here we take a look at what is the nature of these kinds, what we can call them offenses or sins. Actually, there are only five in the Platonic world. And they are very interesting. I find them quite interesting. Well, now I want to go back to this in a few minutes for a reason that I want to share with you because I think it's quite interesting. But so first I'll do this geography and make a couple of points, then we'll go back to it for another reason, because I want to go into it for a greater depth. So the guides finally bring you to the Akchusian Lake. That's the lake where everyone who is neither good nor bad, they've never really done things that are too bad or too good, that's where they go. And when they're there, for what they've done that's good, they get some rewards and punish for the things they did that are... You know. But there's no real crimes. There's no, nothing quite serious there. And therefore, from that point, they can await reincarnation. So, most people, therefore, end up here. 
and they get their rewards and punishments, and then they go on and get reincarnated. So this is the lake of reincarnation. Now, notice what he is now considering the great crimes, the great sins. He says, but when the guide brings these people to the lake, and among them there are people who committed sacrilege and murder, especially wicked murder, they are sent to Tartarus, that's this, Tartarus. To the very bottomless pit. Never to return, no reincarnation. For what? Sacrilege and wicked murders. Then he has another set of crimes. And he gives examples of them. There are examples of them now, so it includes more than what I'm going to mention since there are examples of it. The, the thing that the basic element for these set of crimes now is that they were committed in a moment of passion. There are two kinds. All right, offenses against father and mother. All right, they are the worst. committed at a moment of passion, and homicides, again, committed in a moment of passion. They, too, are sent down, down, down to Coctus. And they have to then spend a long time there. But it's in two periods. The first is here they are at the bottom of Tartarus, and then they go to this river, Coctus. And they spend only a year there, and the wave then washes them up, and then this river then goes by this lake, goes by this lake, doesn't touch it, goes by it. And therefore, those people who have committed offenses have to then encounter the people they have offended, and they have to beseech them and plead with them to allow them to turn around and to be part once more of that great body, that lake, where then they can be reincarnated. But, they have to be they have to cry out, they have to, be, they have to beg to let them come into the lake. So what I'd like to do is just read a couple of those lines so you can see it comes out of the text and it's very nice language, so let me read it for you. But those who appeared to be incurable, on account of the greatness of their wrongdoings, because they have committed many great deeds of sacrilege or wicked mur and abominable murders or any other such crimes, are cast by their fitting destiny into Tartarus, whence they never emerge. Those who are, ever, who are curable, but are found to have committed great sins in a moment of passion, for example, or have done an act of violence against father and mother, but have lived in repentance for the rest of their lives, or who have slain some other person under similar circumstances, passion, These must be thrown into Tartarus. And when they've been there a year, the wave casts them out. Homicides, 
murders go by coctus, and those who have outraged their parents by way of Priflegaton. And when they've been brought by the current to the great Archusian lake, they shout and cry out, calling to those whom they have slain or outraged, begging and beseeching them to be gracious and let them come into the lake. And if they prevail, they come out and cease from their ills. And therefore they have a chance then of going back into the lake for reincarnation. How's that interesting? Look what we have here. Look at the crimes. The great crimes are acts like sacrilege and mur wicked murders. One. One. Two. Those crimes committed under acts of passion. Two kinds. One against father, violence against father and mother, and homicides. Three. Those people who have neither done not, nothing too bad, nothing too good. One, two, three. Hmm? Mediocre. Yeah, 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 yeah. There are two possibilities, of course, for these people who have committed acts of passion. Right, the homicides, homicides go to Coctus, and uh, uh, the pa passions against father and mother go to uh, Flegriton, and then they can then go close to the lake and be saved. One, two, th that's actually one, two, three, and two subclasses. Right. Now look, isn't that interesting? Sacrilege, which is an act against the, the divine. Wicked murders. Passion, crimes of passion, whatever they may be. That can be forgiven. Conscious choosing evil never to return. Now, let me now read what happens then to the others, those philosophers, people who've had this separation of the soul from the body. But those who have found to have excelled in holy living are freed from these regions within the earth and are released as from prisons. And they mount upward into the pure abode and dwell upon this earth. And of these, all who have duly purified themselves by philosophy live henceforth all together without bodies and pass to still more beautiful abodes, which it's not easy to describe. Nor have we now time enough to describe them. So that's very similar then to the to getting off the wheel of life, isn't it? Right? You're reincarnated and reincarnated on and on again until you can pull off the stunt and then there's no longer any return to the Archusian Lake, but rather you live in this place where you can be companions to the gods, right? dialogue with the gods, enter into visions, prophecies, states of mind such as that. And therefore, that's out of the whole cycle of reincarnation. So therefore, if you're purified by philosophy, you're released as from prison. Now, among the rivers, of course, he has four categories. Each of the rivers takes on certain characteristics. Notice it gets worse as you proceed down, which is what you'd expect. Hot and cold, one of the rivers. Fire. Mud that flows before hot lava. That must be really immense, and lava itself. Now, remember I said I wanted to talk about uh, another level of this, and therefore I'm going to risk it now and jump into it. Right? Okay. I want to ask you to compare two things. Right? Just compare two things. That's what we're going to do. I'm going to read you about what the earth looks like, what condition it's in, and then I'm going to read you from another section, and you're going to tell me whether or not you can see some correspondences between the two of them. So,
Ah, okay. Uh, he tells Simeus that there's nothing to prevent my telling what I believe the form of the earth to be and the regions in it after death. So then he starts this way. I am convinced that in the first place, if the earth is round, and in the middle of the heavens, it needs neither the air nor any other similar force to keep it from falling, but its own equipose and the homogeneous nature of the heavens on all sides suffice it to hold it in place. For a body which is an equipose and is placed in the center of something which is homogeneous cannot change its inclinations in any direction, but will always remain in the same position. This then is the first thing of which I am convinced. I'm reading at this point from uh, 79D. When the soul inquires alone by itself, it departs into the realm of the pure, the everlasting, the immortal, and the changeless. And being akin to these, it dwells always with them whenever it is by itself, and it's not hindered, and it has rest from its wanderings and remains always the same, unchanging with the changeless, since it is in communion therewith. And this state of the soul is called wisdom. Hmm. It's always the same and unchanging with the changeless, since it's communion therewith. It departs into the realm of the pure, the everlasting, the changeless, being it's akin to these. Now, what does he say about the earth? It's an equipose, and it's a homogeneous nature of the heavens on all sides, suffices it to hold it in its place. Being an equipose, it's placed in the center of something which is homogeneous, cannot change its inclination. It remains always in the same position. Is there some relationship between the two? So therefore, look here, if you see a correspondence between those two, then the state of the soul on separation bears a very interesting relationship to the way Socrates believes this earth is, this earth is, the true earth, when seen when the soul separates itself from the body. This then is the true earth. Right? True heaven. True light. All right, has the same qualities. Ah, we, oh, we didn't get light. But remember when he described the true earth before? It has all of those beautiful stones and light and images of beautiful things all through it out. So therefore, there's a very close relationship between the two. Is it possible then that the things that he talks about, the nature of the soul, the states of mind that he describes, states of mind that he describes here, have its parallel after death? in the nature of reality? If so, then the soul in separating from the soul from the body experiences the nature of reality before it drops dead, physically. 
If so, then there's a parallel. And this myth captures that parallel development. Now, let's take another point. One of the things that Socrates is very interested in making clear about this myth in the end is that all of the rivers and all of this stuff that's flowing and going about, each of these rivers has the nature of the earth which they flow through. Picks up the qualities, it picks up the qualities of what it flows through. Therefore itself it doesn't have those qualities, doesn't have these qualities. It's rather, if it passes through these qualities, it picks up these qualities. Let's look what he says at another place and see whether we can see something here. Well, it might even be interesting. The difficulty with reading Plato, of course, is I find other paragraphs which are very interesting. I get caught up in it. One of the great problems in Plato, and perhaps in all literature, is what is the problem that all of these wisdom traditions have with pleasure and pain? What is the basic problem in pleasure and pain? What is it? What's interesting first, let me talk about it for a moment. Would you agree there's no way you can escape them? I mean, is it possible to sit on a tack and not feel it? Is it possible to have some honey and not experience pleasure in the sweetness? Is it possible to walk out and feel good and yet not feel pleasure? Is it possible to have a toothache with no pain? What is the problem with pleasure and pain? Why do they talk about it at such, such lengths? What is the nature of this problem? Oh, let me include that in the quote I'm using. Because each pleasure or pain nails it with a nail to the body and rivets it and makes it corporeal. So that it fancies the things are true which the body says are true. What's the problem? And experiencing it you make a judgment and you fancy the things are true which the body says are true. Oh, as an example, what is it that what is it you experience when you experience pleasure that you think is true? We do not agree what you do is you judge it to be good. And when you suffer pain, huh, what do you call that? Oh, that's the problem. It's not, the, it's not pleasure and pain that's the problem. What is it? Making the judgment about these things. That's really not what's good and that's really not what's bad. That's the problem. They're not, they are not in themselves good or bad, but what? The judgment we make about them, which we believe to be true. That's the problem. Now, what is interesting about this, I'd like to push it once more. Right? A moment ago we were saying that all the rivers that flow through all of this material each has the nature of the earth which they flow through. That in itself it's none of those things. It just picks up those qualities through which it flows. Now, pleasure and pain now. 
because each pleasure or pain nails it with the nail to the body and rivets it, right? It makes it corporeal, so that it fancies the things are true which the body says are true. For because it has the same beliefs and pleasures as the body, it's compelled to adopt also the same habits and mode of life. It picks up what? It picks up the habits and the mode of life from its surroundings. And therefore it can never depart in purity to the other world. Now, what's the nature of the problem? Well, what is it? It identifies them with the body, therefore it has no part in the communion with the divine. But what's the nature of the difficulty with this pleasure and pain? Now, there's, it's all caught up in two words. Let's see if I can return to it. The evil is, and the word, the word isn't evil, it's, it's bad, but we'll leave that alone for a moment. Uh, the evil of the bad is that the soul of every man, when it's greatly pleased or pained by anything, is compelled to believe that the object which caused the emotion, it, now this translation says, is very distinct and very true. Now, uh, What's the problem? We want to judge that it's true that it's bad. We want to judge that it's good if it's pleasurable. Right? But there's this other word, and it's called very distinct. Look here, very distinct. That doesn't make any sense. It causes the emotion, right? Which, right? When it's greatly pleased or pained by anything, it's compelled to believe that the object which caused the emotion is very distinct and very true. Well, we can see, therefore, what causes is very true. It's true that it's this, this. But that's not this word. Now, let me introduce a word for you. All right, let's see if we can make it up. No, oh, we'll take this out. Would you agree everything and every person, right, gets into some kind of activity or state of mind when it is most ideally what it is. In other words, in everyone, everyone has a certain kind of excellence that emerges, doesn't it? A certain kind of excellence. So the activity or state of mind that allows us to show that kind of particular excellence which we all possess, whatever that is, um, that is what it is for something to be itself most ideally. Uh, by the way, that's the word they d translate distinct. I suspect there's a little difference between what we mean by distinct and this idea. So let's put it back, all right? So that if someone then experiencing pleasure or pain makes the judgment that that's the way ideally they, they, sh they are, they can be, it's not, it's what? There's nothing wrong with pleasure, nothing wrong with pleasure, what's wrong? There's a higher state of mind to be in than pleasure, that's all. But if you make the judgment that you think that's when you are most fully what you are, then you're simply mistaken. And in the same way, you see, if you think that you should avoid this because that will obviously compromise you in being what you think you most should most ideally want to be, you're wrong again. Why? Because it may take you some pain, struggle, to be what you most want to be. 
And therefore, if you avoid it because it's going to hurt, that would be foolish, wouldn't it? So therefore, what's the problem with pleasure and pain? Only one thing. If you make the judgment, you think that in that activity or state of mind, you are most fully what you think you are, and developing in that sense a certain uh, insight into the very nature of yourself, and that's what you want to be. It's very much like Faust. You know, in part two of Faust, hold thou, hold, hold thy moment so fair. If you can grasp onto a moment when you think you are in an ideal state of mind, for the Platonic tradition, it better be here. It better be an insight into the divine. Otherwise, you're making a bad mistake. Make a bad mistake, then you're going to miss it. That's the problem. It isn't that it in itself is bad, that you're simply going to mistake that for this. Oh, that's all. But what's the problem? Is that in that state, what do we do? We then do this rather curious thing. Once we make that judgment, that if we think a particular pleasure is where we are most fully ourselves, then we're compelled, as he puts it, we're compelled to adopt those habits and that mode of life where we can experience that. That's the problem. That's all. There's really nothing wrong with that mode of life in itself. It doesn't make any difference. So that's what you do. But what? It'll keep you from going to a much more lofty and profound goal. That's the problem. It deprives you from a more noble and divine insight into the nature of reality. So here, all of these rivers pushing back and forth, right? they pick up the nature of the earth which they flow. When we identify with these things, either positively or negatively, we pick up the lifestyles and the mode of li life that will produce those kinds of things. Very similar. So let me get to the next, next very, very interesting part. Um, Okay. I'm going to um, tell you first what I th think we may be able to conclude. Here we have a picture that Plato identifies as the real earth. See the real earth. You either go into its interior and experience all these things, or you live on the earth itself, right? in the real earth on the surface as it were. And that real earth on the surface, of course, is experiencing reality. Right? Or you descend in one of these regions and then finally find your way to the Atrusian Lake and then are reborn. But what is this like if we could read it? All these forces and all of these things going on and on. He describes it like a serpent, great power. Now, is it possible that when we read this, it may be, again, very similar to what may be described as kundalini yoga. For kundalini yoga, I'm sure as all of you know, works on the belief that there is a spinal column that runs through, therefore you have to keep the spine erect when you're meditating, and on each side, each side, there are two streams, the Ida and the Pingala, as it's called. 
And the whole goal of Kundalini Yoga is to wake up the source of the energy at the base of the spine and allow it to course its way all the way up until it showers into the shashuma or the top of the head. That's called enlightenment, Kundalini Yoga. However, as it courses its way through here, you go through all kinds of different states of mind. One, two, three, four, five, six, that's right. Six centers and then the top shishishuma. Now, the description of that hollow of the two rivers or the two streams which course their way up the spine and since it does that, it leaves a trace as if it were like a serpent going across the sands. That's where they call it. it has vast power. Is it possible when we read this, since this is the journey of the soul, this is the journey of the soul, after all, occur, this is the journey of the soul, up through these, through all these different lakes to be reincarnated until you finally reach the point when you can live on the surface of the earth, the real earth, the real heaven, the real light, and experience the nature of the divine. That's a journey of consciousness going through all of those stages, all those lakes. Could it be possible that we can line them up in such a way that it might be similar to the Kundalini Yoga? Is it possible? If so, we have an interesting parallel. So let me read you it. Well, well, maybe I should skip a little bit. I mean, it's a long paragraph, but let me read it. <clears throat> Such then is the nature of the earth as a whole and of the things around it. But around about the whole earth in the hollows of it, are many regions, some deeper and wider than that in which we live, some deeper but with a narrower opening than ours, some also less in depth and wider. Now all these are connected with one another by many subterranean passage channels, some larger, some smaller, which are bored in all of them. And there are passages through which water flows from one to the other, as into mixing bowls. And there are everlasting rivers of huge size under the earth, flowing with hot and cold water. There's much fire, rivers of fire, and many streams of mud, some thinner, some thicker, like the rivers of mud that flow before the lava in Sicily, and then the lava itself. These fill the various regions as they happen to flow to one or another at any time. Now there's a kind of oscillation within the earth, moves all these up and down. The nature of the oscillation up and down is as follows. One of the chasms of the earth is greater than the rest. It's bored right through the whole earth. And many of the poets call this Tartarus. That's the one going right through the whole thing. For all the rivers flow together into this chasm and flow out again. They have each the nature of the earth through which they flow. And the reason why all the streams flow in and out is that this liquid matter has no bottom or foundation, so it oscillates in waves up and down. And the air and the wind about it do the same. For they follow the liquid both when it moves towards the other side of the earth and when it moves towards this side. Just as breath of those who breathe blows in and out, 
So the wind there oscillates with the liquid and causes terrible and irresistible blast as it rushes in and out. Now, in yoga, there's what's called bashtika, which is a breathing exercise where there's violent breath pouring in and out, and it looks very much like this. And when the water retires to the region which we call the lower, it flows into the rivers there and fills them up, pumps them into them. And when it, really, when it leaves that region, it comes back to uh, this side. It fills the rivers there. And so he has a whole flowing going all over, see. Some flow in one side from which they flow out, and others the opposite side. Some pass completely around in a circle, coiling about the earth once or several times like serpents, then descend to the lowest possible depth and fall again into the chasm. Now, it's possible to go down from each side of the center, but not beyond. And it's possible to go down both sides, just like in Kundalini Yoga. And then he mentions in this structure these lakes and these rivers. And therefore, you know what? Could it be possible that the way in which they're describing them are these intense states that are experienced in this strange game called yoga and kundalini yoga. I wanted to share that with you just to uh, show you that there may be a way of doing it. Now the way best to do it would be to bring someone who's practiced these kinds of breathing exercises, see whether we could get them to describe it, see whether or not they can talk about the different centers that it opens up and whether or not some are dangerous and some are full of fire and some are full of heat, because those are the very words and the language they use in Kundalini Yoga. If so, then, Plato then is expressing a kind of interesting yoga, the separation of the soul from the body, and in that process, the person itself goes through these different states of mind, which can be represented in this way, and if so, there's a very interesting relationship between Plato's use of mythology and the way it can then be represented in the psychic experiences of man as against the shamanistic practices which go all the way to India and all the way up to Siberia. So let me conclude by giving you just one section where he does a beautiful job and he talks very much like what's sacred to Apollo. Now, I said that in the beginning, and let me just uh, fill in a little few things about Apollo. Of course, Apollo declares the will of Zeus to all men, the unfailing will of Zeus to mankind. All right? Um, he represents, ideally, the Hellenic spirit. <clears throat> He's the god of light. And later, in the course of Apollo's uh, history, uh, in mythology, he's identified with the sun, of course. And source of inspiration. And he does for the soul what light does for the world, what the sun and the light do for the world. He's the lord of music and song, of prophecy, healer. He. Uh, pronounces natural law, nurtures law. He uncults high moral and religious principles. He's a purifier and patron of the religious spirit of Delos. His key expression, of course, is to know thyself. And yet for all of that, he's strange. So I just read one section of, of uh, the middle of the Phaedo which is at 85, <clears throat> he likens himself Ah, Simeas, he says, I should have had hard work to persuade other people that I do not regard my present situation as a misfortune when I cannot even make you believe it, but you are afraid I am more curlish now than I used to be. 
And you seem to think I'm inferior in prophetic power to the swans. Swans were the favorite, of course, to Apollo. Who sing at other times also, but when they feel that they are to die, they sing the most and the best in their joy that they are to go to the God whose servants they are. But men, because of their own fear of death, misrepresent the swans and say they sing for sorrow in mourning for their own death, but not the case. They do not consider that no bird sings when it's hungry or cold or any, has any other trouble, not even the nightingale or the swallow. I do not believe they sing for grief, nor do the swans. But since they are Apollo's birds, I believe they have prophetic vision. And because they have foreknowledge of the blessings in the other world, they sing and they rejoice on that day more than ever before. And I think I am myself a fellow servant of the swans. And I'm consecrated to the same God, Apollo, and have received from our master a gift of prophecy no whit inferior to theirs. And that I go out from life with, a little, with as little sorrow as they He therefore sees himself as, uh, in, the, in the very guise and having some of the very same powers that befit a representative of Paul. So that's what I wanted to take you through today, how to look at the Phaedo or Plato through mythology. And thank you for coming. Any questions we can play with? Did the Neoplatonists later on like Proclus ever revise um, the idea of the legs, like taking, deleting from their philosophy, the concept of oh. Taurus. The reason I ask that is I find mm. it very difficult to accept that, however bad a person is, like a Hitler or a mm. Nero, um, nevertheless, that person, however bad a person is, that person's soul is going to be lost forever. Yeah. I find that very, very oh, yes. hard to accept. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, many people do. Yeah, oh, yeah. And there's Is some. Anything, you should come, I mean, people like that yeah, yeah. <laughs> need a great party. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it would be nice to have a round table discussion yeah. with Stalin, Hitler, <laughs> right? <laughs> Up there in the other world and say, okay, gentlemen, what did you learn from this last experience? And let's take a look at it. I'll mention that next time I talk to Steve Allen. <laughs> <laughs> I those people. Oh, you have a meeting of the minds. Yeah. I like that show you have. Oh, good. Yeah. I think it would be interesting dialogue, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Right. We can put a couple of other names, right? Pol Pot, yeah. um, yeah. Mao Zedong. Yeah. Right, right. I mean, uh, uh, not Mao Zedong. Uh, uh, but even, Mao. I find it hard to believe that even they are lost forever. I really do. They all thought they were doing good. Yeah, I think it. Pol Pot thought he was doing good. I, don't. I think Hitler thought he was saving humanity. I, I don't think there's any doubt, is there? I mean, they were certainly motivated by what they thought was good. Read parts of Mein Kampf, you know, he was trying to save the world from yeah. these horrible, horrible yeah. things that were polluting the world. Yeah, in fact, if you uh, um, read Das Kapital, uh, the, the way he depicts industrial conditions for the worker in those days is, is staggering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, very terrible. Yeah, it's a whole litany of crimes. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with you, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, that was an interesting point you brought up, because granted, these people were, um, even though Proclus and the others don't use the word evil for our purposes, I'll use evil, the word evil. They were evil. But you're right, evil people don't see themselves as evil. You know, the way we're don't. talking about them the way we are yeah. is because they lost the war, and we're writing the history. Now, That's if the Nazis right. had lost the war, we'd have uh, a picture of him Right oh, you there. mean Nazis Hitler. Hitler. Oh, sure. I mean, I mean, right Nazis won the war. We'd have a picture right. of Hitler over here, oh. and, and we'd be talking about the good things he, do, he and did, and we wouldn't even consider the Holocaust because nobody would be thinking about that as a bad thing. That would be just a, you know, a oh. casualty of war. Or he'd have to build more of them. Maybe. Yeah. 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 It would take a step, it would take his philosophy even further. Mm -hmm. Yes, That's yes. What we would do. Yeah. And certainly history and is full of it. And he would call it good. Oh, he would. He did. Oh, did. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Matter of yeah, fact, right. he thought the German people failed him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he said, I didn't. I'm all right. You guys failed me. Yeah. Yeah. That'd make an interesting novel if Hitler had won the war. 
Yeah. If, oh, if they may, yeah, yeah, they have, yeah, yeah. 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 I don't think it has. If uh, Martin Luther had given get, given in to the Pope and yeah. conceded, yeah. you know, what a different world we would have had if all of Europe was Catholic. All those what ifs. And, you know, fighting the United Monsters, maybe oh. today. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's right. Same that's people, right. Cardinal that's right. Right. So the real question is, yeah. you see, if the whole game here is you have to take with you what you really have learned on that higher level, what you've really matured and learned, that's going to account for your journey. And so the real question is, how do you determine what it is you've learned? Yeah. Can I ask a question about the other end of that? Um, he mentions that uh, in the true earth, mm -hmm. the uh, true heaven, uh, you live longer, which is to make the assumption that you again experience a death. Yes, that's certainly the case, and that's why it's interesting when he returns to that, he doesn't talk about any reincarnation at all, does he? No, no. I wonder no. about that. I so did what too. happens there? Yeah, you're quite right. That's there. Mm -hmm. Is that a, a second purification? Or? Um, I think if we went back, we would find both things exactly as you described them. That's right. As an example, over there he talks about the fact that there are no diseases. Right? And he talks about the, the fact that everything there is purer. So there is that contrast we were making, isn't it? And he does say that there they live longer. That's right. Which is to assume that... Assumes that there may be dead sometime. That's right. But if there's no disease, then what would be the cause? Yeah. So, and therefore, in the end, where, when he talks about uh, the, the quote I just read you, is that they're literally off the wheel of, of reincarnation. It looks like a separate group. And you, it would be, then you'd have to go back into the text and see whether you can reconcile those two pieces. Yeah, but you're right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Right, take a look. I'm just trying to find out if, uh, I'm hoping that you, you, know, you might have uh, another thing to steer me to. Well, I can. other works of, uh, with or in this. Do, um, because I, I don't remember delving back. Here, I, I can get it for you quite easily. Um, We're contrasting two sections. Um, the conclusion to the whole work is the one we read just a moment ago. That looks like you're off the wheel of birth and death. Um, let's see whether we, we can recapture that then. But those who are found to have excelled in holy living are freed from these regions within the earth and are released as from prisons. They mount upward into their pure abode and dwell upon the earth. And of these, all who have duly purified themselves by philosophy live henceforth altogether without bodies and pass to still more beautiful abodes, which it's not easy to describe, nor have we the time enough. The thing that we would be looking for in this quote is whether there's some sense of, of uh, immortality or absolutely continuation. All right? um, they're freed from th those regions within the earth, that's all right, as if released from prison. They mount. They mount upward into the pure abode and dwell upon the earth. Purified by philosophy, they live henceforth, altogether without bodies and past. So the whole thing is going to be left with henceforth, isn't it? You'd have to hang that on it. Of course, you have to make sure that's there. Um, so going into the preceding quote, Um, and the earth there is adorned with all these jewels, also the gold and silver, and everything more beautiful. 
so much so that the uh, earth is a sight to make blessed those who look upon it. And the seasons are so tempered that people there have no diseases and live much longer than we and in sight and hearing and wisdom and all such things are much superior to us as air is purer than water or ether to air. And they have sacred groves and temples of the gods in which the gods really dwell. They have intercourse with the gods by speech, prophecies, and visions. And they see the sun and the moon and the stars as they really are. And in all other ways their blessedness is in accordance with this. So it, that, that dilemma is there. It suggests sort of a, some other kind of evolution beyond yeah. the physical, you know, Yes, that last line suggests that, doesn't it, right? It's like, you know, they go to some places which is even very difficult to describe. We don't have enough time. So, <laughs> right? That's so, good right? information. Well, in three more paragraphs, he's drinking the hemlock, so. <laughs> <laughs> or three pages. So, uh, but yes, it certainly does that. You know, it, it certainly is there. And in other words, those pieces are there. And uh, that's what he left us. And I can't save it. That's, that's the dilemma as we read it. Um, but notice we're putting a lot of emphasis on the word hereafter, so we'd have to make sure whether or not that could be translated in another way and make sure that that's safe. Right, have to go on that next level and see whether it's there. Right. That's the game they play when you get into it. <laughs> then they can save it by translations. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I enjoyed well, continuing to take you through it.